The Gospel of Luke. Luke investigated many of the earliest eyewitnesses of the life of Jesus and then composed this account. And the story begins up in the hills of Jerusalem, the place where Israel's ancient prophets said that God himself would come one day to establish his kingdom over all the earth. In the city is the temple run by the priests. And one of them, named Zechariah, was working in the temple when he had a vision that freaks him out. An angel appears and says that he and his wife will have a son. What's this all about? Well, Zechariah and his wife, we're told, are very old. They've never been able to have children. And Luke's setting up a parallel here with Abraham and Sarah, the great ancestors of Israel, because they too were very old and could never have kids. Yet God gave them a son, Isaac, which is how the whole story of Israel began. And so Luke's implying here that God's about to do something that significant for this people once again. The angel tells Zechariah to name the son John. And then he says that this son's going to fulfill a promise of Israel's ancient prophets, that somebody would come one day to prepare Israel to meet their God when he arrived to rule in Jerusalem. Because right now, Jerusalem is ruled by the Romans. Yeah, specifically, it's governed by a man named Herod, who's a puppet king under the Roman Empire. And so the Jewish people wanted nothing more than to be free and govern themselves in their own land. So this is shocking news. Everything's going to change. God's on his way. But how is he going to arrive? Well, to find out, Luke takes us out of Jerusalem and then up into a small town in the hills of an out-of-the-way region called Galilee. There we find a young woman named Mariam, or we call her Mary. She was engaged to be married. And then an angel appears to Mary saying that she's going to have a son. She's supposed to name him Jesus, which in Hebrew means the Lord saves. And he will be a king like David who will rule over God's people forever. And then Mary asks, okay, well, how is this possible? Because I'm a virgin. And she's told that the same Holy Spirit that brought life and light out of darkness in Genesis chapter 1 is going to generate life inside her womb. God is about to bind himself to humanity through the conception and the birth of the Messiah. And so Mary goes from some backwoods no-name girl to the future mother of the king? Exactly. In fact, she sings a song about how this reversal of her own social status points to a greater upheaval to come. Through her son, God's going to bring down rulers from their thrones and exalt the poor and the humble. He's going to turn the whole world order upside down. So when Mary was really pregnant, she and her fiancé Joseph had to go down to Bethlehem. Yeah, there was a decree across the Roman Empire about new taxes, and so everybody had to go get registered in the town of their family line. There were so many visitors in Bethlehem, they can't find a guest room. And so the only place they can find is a spot where animals sleep. Now nearby were some shepherds with their flocks, and an angel appears, which of course freaks them out. But they're told to celebrate because tonight in Bethlehem, a savior has been born. Yeah, they're told to go and find this baby and they'll know that it's the Messiah because he's going to be wrapped up and laying in a grimy feeding trough. Yeah, which is pretty gross. Totally. And then these shepherds who aren't very clean themselves, they go and find the newborn Jesus in this really dingy place and their minds are blown. They go home wondering what on earth is about to happen. And this is all really strange. I mean, if God's really coming to save the world, this isn't how you would expect him to arrive. Born in an animal shelter to a teenage girl, celebrated by no-name shepherds. Exactly. I mean, everything is backwards in Luke's story, and that's the point. He is showing how God's kingdom was first revealed in these dirty places among the poor, because Jesus is here to bring salvation by turning our world order upside down. Amen. Who loves Jesus up in this place, yeah? That's awesome. So the birth of Jesus Christ shows us that God had a purpose for mankind. Right? He had a purpose for all of us. And we know in the scriptures in John 3.16, uh, who can quote John 3.16 for me? All right, let's, let's read it together. John 3.16, put it up there. Let's say it together. One, two, three, go. All right, because our Father 
I think sometimes we misunderstand who our father is and we think that, you know, our father up there is wanting to punish and kill everyone. Uh, he is a just God. And part of his nature and character is that those who are guilty, if you, you read that when uh, Moses actually uh, saw him uh, and he revealed his character to him, uh, one of the things he told him, he, he said that those that are guilty will not go unpunished. So God's a just God. However, we also read through the prophets that we serve a God that wants to see no one punished. We serve a God that doesn't want to see anyone destroyed. And he went through great lengths to, to try to help mankind. And, of course, you know, ultimately he sends his son to do the job. But it really started back in Genesis where he made Adam and Eve and he gave them a perfect environment. Who messed that up? Did man mess that up or did God mess that up? We did, right? And so the first Adam, Adam and Eve, messed that whole thing up. I found sometimes God can do some pretty wonderful things in your life, and we could end up messing up those wonderful things by sin. We can mess up some wonderful things in our life. They had messed it up, and of course the world got really messed up. And God tolerated it because one of the things about his nature as well is God is slow to what? He's slow to anger. So God will bear with us a long time and generations and generations. He'll bear with us. And so he's bearing with man. And so man but man got so wicked, so messed up that eventually he's like, okay, I'm through with this. And so what's the next, when he, where's the next reset? The flood, okay? So the flood is the next reset. Uh, Brian, who was the person that he used to bring about that reset? What family? Noah. And so God is about patriarch, all right? He loves patriarch. And so we live in a world today that hates patriarch. But God loves patriarch. And so you had Noah that he said, okay, I'm going to reset and I'm going to use Noah and I'm going to use his family and we're just going to restart this whole thing. So he restarted. And so, but guess what? What did man do with that after a time? He messed that up too. So God said, well, let me, let me go. And where's the next big reset take place uh, after Noah? Where do we see the next reset take place? Who? Huh? No. Where's the next reset? Abraham. Thank you, Jeff. So Abraham, because then God said, okay, I'm going to start with another family. How many know God loves using families? And so he said, I'm going to start with another family. I'm going to start with Abram. Because uh, at the time he wasn't Abraham. He said, I'm going to start with Abram. And that's when he called out Abram and he said, hey, I want you to leave where you're at. I'm going to make you into a great nation. I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to bless you. Those who bless you will be blessed. Those who curse you will be cursed. And, and so that's the Abrahamic covenant. And so Abraham starts the what race? The Hebrew people. So the Hebrew people are derived uh, from Abraham. And so, and then he, of course, we know becomes the father of the faith. But so then, what's the next big move that he does? Because, you know, all this goes on. And, and what's the, the next big move that happens? Because they end up, all of his people, you know, end up in, in bondage eventually, Right. And so what was the next big move? Moses. So then Moses comes in. Moses rolls out the law and what the law is. And, and so that went on uh, for a while there where they were following the law. Then, then he wanted to set up his kingdom. And so he brought a king in. What was the king's name? King David. So Saul was definitely first. But Saul was the people's choice. Saul was not God's choice. And so God actually warned them, and they did it anyway, and they got Saul. But then they've got God's choice, which is David, because man, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks what? On the inside. And so, and then, of course, Israel continues on in history. But then God, in the dispensation of time, uh, he's, he's like, okay, I'm going to come for the final time. One of, the, my, one of my, not final, but one of my final acts is I'm going to bring my son Jesus. 
And so because I love the world, he didn't say I hate the world so much I'm bringing Jesus. And I want us to make sure we understand that, especially when we're talking to others. God does not hate the world. He loves the world. Uh, matter of fact, when the angels were singing, they were talking about peace and goodwill and who, to men in whom God is pleased. And if you read about Jesus in Proverbs 8, you see that, that Jesus uh, is wisdom. And he was there in the beginning. And he said he delighted in mankind. So he, he wanted to come and he wanted to be here and he wanted to help us all. And so for God so loved the world that he came he gave Jesus, and, and then Jesus said, I didn't come, and he made clear, he said, I didn't come to judge the world, but I came to keep the world from judgment. And so to offer myself as this living sacrifice so that, so that we can live and, and not be under the wrath of God. Now, he's not done there because now that he's done that, he started his kingdom, and his kingdom is operating upon the earth uh, as we speak, Right? And so, but the next big thing that's going to happen, what's the next big thing that's going to happen? Can anyone tell me? All right, Jesus is coming back. And when he comes back, there's going to be a what? New heaven and new earth. So Jesus is coming back, going to be a new heaven and new earth. And that's what we're waiting for. So those of us who've accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we've been saved from the wrath of God. We've been saved from our sin. We've been saved from this perverse generation. And so now we're here on a Wednesday night. We just ate hamburgers, beans, potato salad, and uh, Rice Krispies. But I want to ask you something. While we're waiting for Jesus to come, and I believe he's coming soon, while we're waiting for him to come and while we're waiting for the new heaven and the new earth, what should we be doing in the meantime? Raise your hand. What should we be doing? Should we just be eating hamburgers and beans and stuff like that? What should we be doing? Raise your hand. Say it loud. Witnessing. Oh, witnessing. Yes. So, again, it's a great time to do that, right? To witness, I, I just want to say this, guys, and uh, I've got a book that's going to be coming out soon, and I taught on this a while back. It's called The Essentials. But one of the things about being fulfilled on the inside of you, uh, a lot of people understand that man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? All right, every rhema that comes from the mouth of God. Rhema means revealed word, not logos which is just written word. A lot of people read the Bible and it does nothing for them. It has to be revealed. And if you're not in the Spirit, and that's why it's so important to be in the Spirit while you're reading the Bible. And that's why I put the Bible, my reading, at the end of my time with the Lord because I've been in the Spirit now for a couple hours. And then when I open up the Scriptures and I'm communing with the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord brings alive these Scriptures. And it is food it's literally food for my spirit, and it's renewing of my mind. But that's where we stop in Christianity, not realizing that there's another food that we have to eat, and it's, it's the food of doing the Father's work. That's when Jesus was at the well with the woman, and he didn't eat, and they said, well, did he eat? And he said, I've got food that you don't know about. And my food is to do the work of my Father who is in heaven. And then he explained to him, the work of my Father is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God. In other words, his work is for us to compel people to be saved, to believe on Jesus, to confess with their mouth and believe in their heart that he is the Son of God. And that he rose from the dead. That he ascended to the Father. And he is coming back to get us again. And he's preparing a place for us in the heavens right now. And we are going to have a new earth in a new heaven. Come on, someone. This is what we're called to do. But when you do not, I see people all the time in Christianity, they're bored in their Christianity because all they do is feed on one food group. You know, if you only eat one food group, you become very unhealthy. 
You have to have that balanced out. Actually, actually, the word is the appetizer. The main meal is when we're sharing our faith with others because we're called to be ambassadors. We have been given the ministry of reconciliation. And so when we're not sharing our faith, there is going to be an empty, emptiness on the inside of us, and we're going to think that it's the pastor's fault or it's the you know, it's my wife's fault or my husband's fault or it's where I'm working. And we can't figure out where this, I, know, I believe in Jesus, but I still got this emptiness. Because this emptiness could only be filled by you sharing your faith. When you start sharing your faith with others, there is something that awakens on the inside of you. There is a passion that is unleashed there is, a, there is a energy that comes inside of you. I mean, it's like, it's like eating 100 grams of protein. It just, man, you're just, you're building yourself incredibly up in the Lord. And you're going to be the healthiest you've ever been in your entire life. Because if all you do is just drink in the Word and do nothing with it, then why should God reveal any of it to you? Because he does not waste. We don't serve a God who wastes. He even says pick up the, the scraps and make sure you put them in the baskets. God is not a wasteful God. He will not waste his revelations if they're only going to sit there and do nothing. And so we need to take what the Lord is, is, is showing us in those scriptures and we need to be sharing them with others. We need to be sharing our story with others. You know, when, let me just ask you this. When's the last time you shared your story about what God's done in your life with someone else? With a coworker, with a friend, with a neighbor. And, and, and you've done the hard work to build the relationship so that you could share it. Oh, come on. Did you hear what I just said? Because then life becomes not about using up the world. It becomes about changing the world. And I'll tell you what. That's something I can get up for. This idea of uh, we're here to get so blessed where we just wallow around and, and an angel fans us and we don't have to do anything. We're just in this lazy boy just chilling out. And, and that's where we're going to, you know, we're just going to sit, you know, fat, dumb, and happy. And that's how we're going to get to heaven. That is, that is not, so far from the truth of what God's word is and what he tells us that we ought to be doing. And, the, and, and, and there's no fulfillment in that whatsoever. Listen, there's only so much nothing you can keep doing. If you want to be bored out of your mind, do nothing. If you, want to, if you want to be challenged every day, if you want to have zeal in your heart, if you want to have enthusiasm on the inside of you, which, by the way, means God in you, then, then what you need to do is you need to awaken the senses to understand that there's a purpose to all of this. The purpose of Jesus coming, our Father sending him, the purpose in it is that we would share it with others so that people would get saved and not one person would, would, would go to hell. Not one person would be under the wrath of God. Not one person would be eaten up by the culture around us. Why? Because we're going to share the gospel, which is the power of God and the salvation to anyone who would believe. <laughs> Guys. So this idea of just sitting around, shining our light in each other's face, we are called to go out and to reach the loss. So what should we be doing if you are not involved in trying to reach a lost person around you right now, then something's wrong. You're off mission. You, you lost focus. We should always be working on someone. I don't care if it takes 10 years to get them. We should be work, praying for them, sharing with them in a Christ-centered spirit way. Not in a, not in a want to notch my belt, arrogant way. Amen? And so I just want to encourage you guys. Man, who are we sharing with? Who are we speaking? So, so, so we're not here just to eat hamburgers and beans and potato salad and 
Rice Krispies. We are here to change the world. The purpose of this night is so that you would be equipped to do the work of God. What is the work of God? I just said it. Come on, what is the work of God? Someone tell me. To believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So the work of God is to get people to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the work of God. That is what we're called to do. That is why we wake up. That is why we go to work. That is why we give. That is why we serve. That is why we act the way we're supposed to be acting is so that we would be a light and a good representation of our Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit on the inside of us, knowing that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And then we're walking by the Spirit. We know we're a child of God. But we got to do more. We got to witness because the Holy Spirit is a helper. And he said, I'm here to help you do that. He said, that's my role. My role is convict the world of sin, righteousness, and of judgment. My role is to draw the world to Jesus Christ. That is the role of the Holy Spirit. And we are the ones that have to share Christ. Because if we don't share it, how are they going to know it? And God handcuffed himself with you and I. Because the only way it's going to be done is if we do it. He said, I'm not going to do it himself. He's going to help us do it. Why did he do that? He said, because I've asked you for your heart, now I gave you mine. My heart is that everybody gets saved and no one... I'm amazed at how many people are, oh, what's the will of God? What's the will of God? What's the will of God? The will of God is pretty easy. Everyone gets saved. That's what it says. Just look up the will of God in the Bible, and you'll know the will of God for your life. No, we get so self-centered, we're looking for what we want instead of looking for what God wants. So we don't really want his will. We want our will. We need to say to heck with our will. Not my will be done, but your will be done. And God's will is that no one would perish. Does anyone here know someone lost? Raise your hand. You work with them. You live by them. If your hand's not up, I want to talk to you. Raise your hand. If anyone here knows someone lost, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Then then let me tell you something then you have something to do tomorrow. You have something to do this week. You should never, ever be in a place where you think you have nothing to do for God. Listen, everything, everybody think, well, if you're not up here preaching, not up here singing, you're not doing something like that, you're not doing something for God. Listen, the greatest thing we do for God is what you do when you leave here. And listen, listen to me when I say this. People can benefit from being invited to church, and God can't speak to them, and he does. People got saved, get saved almost every week. This past week, y'all saw how many people got saved, raised their hand, giving their life to Christ. So that can't happen. So it's okay to invite them to church, but you can't cop out with just inviting them to church because only 1% of the people are going to get saved get saved in church. Majority of people are going to get saved are going to have to get saved because you get bold enough to share your faith with them, and then you... Endeavor to live holy enough so that you don't hinder you sharing your faith with them. See, we want, oh, I got to live holy so I can be blessed. No, you got to live holy so you can represent Jesus to the world where they'll want to hear what you got to say. You know what blessed means? Blessed means to be envied. So people should look at your life, look at your marriage, look at your walk, look at your demeanor, look at your hard work, look at, look at your purpose. They should be able to look at you and go, golly, I want that. And then we can go, oh, can I tell you a story? But before I tell you a story, I want to hear your story. So won't you tell me your story? Because I, I'm here, and then I'm not here to judge you. I, I, I'm okay with where you're at. I'm not appalled that you are a homosexual. I'm not appalled that you are a drunkard. I'm not appalled that you are a thief. I'm not appalled that you are a politician. 
Seriously, I'm not appalled. I, I am here to hear your story and accept you where you're at, but I love you enough and God loves you enough not to leave you where you're at. Because I don't expect you to be something that you can't be without knowing the person I know. Let me tell you something. Our Father, our Father so loved the world that he gave his only son to come down and to be the perfect sacrifice. And he punished him so that we wouldn't be under his wrath. He satisfied the debt of sin. And now sin is... Is, is been destroyed by what Jesus did on the cross. And what you're struggling with in your life, let me tell you something, Jesus came to break off of you. Wow. So guys, we got stuff to do. And then, and then also serving the poor and the hurting. Listen, matter of fact, that's what we're going to be judged for. I'm so sick and tired of the petty stuff that people talk about and say they deal with and all that. Listen, things are important for your life, yes. But when you start looking at the starving people out in the world, the, the people that are, are oppressed and, and they can lose their life at any moment, what are we complaining about? What are we complaining about? We need to be reaching them. We need to be helping them. And we are as a church. We are. We use, we use every resource that we can to do that. And the only thing stopping us from doing more is more obedient servants who understand that. Be honest with you. And, and we, we, it's, it's, it's crazy, the, the, the harvest that is there, if we understand this is what we're supposed to do. Serving the poor builds the platform that we preach from. Because everyone's like, whoa, man, look at what they're doing. That's love. Amen? All right, the second thing tonight. The birth of Jesus Christ shows us that nothing is impossible with God. Nothing. Say nothing. Genesis 18, I want to I read this. He alluded to it in the... Scripture there, how God, when he does something, he does it supernaturally because he wants everyone to know it was him. But this is where he had told Abraham uh, and Sarah, they remember the three guys that visit him, and they come to the tent, and they go and they kill some food, and they cook him for them, and the three guys are there ministering with Abraham, and, and it's the Lord, the Lord you know, said, hey, Sarah's going to have a baby, and I want you to see what happens here. Uh, but the Lord said to Abraham, and so after, after the Lord said, Sarah's going to have a baby, I'm going to give you that baby that I've been telling you I was going to give you. Uh, you know, Sarah was in the tent listening to this. And it said, but the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh, saying, shall I actually give birth to a child when I am so old? Is anything too difficult for the Lord? And this is the Lord telling Abraham this. He said, why did Sarah say, shall I give birth to a child when I'm old? And this is what the Lord said. Is anything too difficult for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you. And at this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah denied it. <laughs> she denied it. And she said, I didn't laugh. For she was afraid. And he said, no but you did laugh. And see, I wonder how many times, you know, God says what he wants to do with us and only he can do it. And, 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 and we don't really understand how that can be done because we're not spiritual people no more. Because we only can think in the natural. And then we laugh at those things. Instead of, instead of believing in those things. And then we deny, oh, I, didn't, I, I didn't laugh. What she was saying is, I didn't have unbelief. Oh, yes, you did. But I love God. He said, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> I love this about God. But sometimes it upsets him a little bit. I mean, 
what was interesting, he got the Lord talking to him. And, but when Zechariah, when, when Zechariah had another case where Elizabeth's too old to have a baby and God supernaturally comes down and the angel comes and tells Zechariah, hey, your wife's going to be pregnant. And he's like, say what? What do you mean my wife's going to be pregnant? Yeah, your wife's going to be pregnant. And he's like, ah, oh, how can that be? Well, he kind of ticked off this angel. And like I said, he wasn't <laughs> dealing with the Lord here. He's dealing with his angel. And the angel said, okay, because you did not believe my message to you, you're, you're going to be mute. You're not going to be able to speak until that child is born. And so... You know, in one case, you know, the Lord was like, okay, I know you, yeah, you did laugh, but here is like, hey, nothing is too hard for God. And here is, you know, it's God speaking to you. And yet you're still doubting. How many times did I watch this happen? I know this was happening. I know God was speaking to people. And they know that it was the Lord, yet they still doubt. Because ultimately, I think our major issue in Christianity is we don't really believe what we say we believe. I'm telling you. How do I know that? Because you, me, we all do what we believe. We don't do what we say. But we all do what we believe. And so if you want to know what you believe, just look at what you do. And what you do is is the indicator of what you believe. All right, if someone, you know, does something to you, if you you curse them, if you're mad at them, and months go by and you don't forgive them, then you're telling, you're showing yourself what you believe. You do not believe in the cross of Jesus Christ. You do not believe it. Or you won't forgive yourself about something you did. I had so many people just say, oh, I can't forgive myself. I'm like, that's because you don't believe. You really have never believed in Jesus and what Jesus did on the cross. Because if you would believe, you would repent and, and, and cry out to God and get up with no load on you, with no guilt on you, because the scriptures I read says that the blood of Jesus removes guilt and condemnation. Those who in Christ therefore have no condemnation. And so it it gets back to what we believe. Do we believe? Hence, you go to Mary, and Mary goes, wait a minute, I'm a virgin. And say, yeah, but God's able to do this. Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. And what did Mary say? Let it be done unto me as you have said. Guys, that's how we've got to begin to carry ourselves. Is Lord, let it be done unto me as you have said. You've said it. That settles it. And I believe it. And we're going to walk in it. But I want to go back to this whole thing where anything is possible for God. Anything. Sarah, come up here, Sarah. Come up here, Sarah. Get on, get on the keys, Sarah. Anything is possible with God. Um, bring up that next quote for me if you don't mind. Guys, in the back, bring up the next quote for me, please. Do you have something in your life right now that only God can fix or make happen? Now let me ask you the question that that our Lord asks Abraham is anything impossible with God? No, nothing. Then we ought to pray and believe that God can do it. God can do it. I know He can. I call it Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego pray. Because they were like, hey, king, I just let you know, 
we're not bowing because we know that God can deliver us. We know he can. But you need to know something, King. Even if he doesn't, <laughs> I'd rather go down believing than bow down to you. We got we to gotta believe and know that God can do this. And pray. And not just pray, but be persistent in our prayer. We give up so easy. That's why Jesus said when he taught about prayer, and he used the old widow, going back to the judge, and he said, when I come back, will I still find faith here? Will people still be asking me and crying out to me for me to do things in their life? That was another question. Will I, will I still find people really believing, grabbing a hold of me, beating, beating on the door, coming to me? You don't come to someone if you don't think they can do something for you. So when we don't go to God, that tells a lot about what we believe. We say we believe in prayer. We don't believe in prayer. You want the smallest meeting in church? Call a prayer meeting. I'm just serious. You want the smallest meeting in church? You call a prayer meeting. It's horrible. It really is. He was, I don't want to be like Jesus. I don't want to follow Jesus. Well, Jesus never ceases to make intercession on our behalf. So if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, you've got to be a prayer person. You've got to be someone that's crying out to God all the time. Hence, going back to what I talked to you about, spending time with the Lord and really spending time with the Lord. You, you know one of the things that takes so much time when you spend time with the Lord? Honoring His name is a, is a big part. Thanking Him is a big part. But also, because you're praying for all the other people, not just yourself. In other words, you're being like Jesus. So who in here says... Man, I, I, got, I got something that only God can do. Only he can make this happen. Who in here would raise their hand and say, that's me? That's me. This is what we're going to do right now. I want you to keep your hand up. Keep your hand up. And I want, if your hand's not up and you can believe and you can really pray and believe and you'll open your mouth and you'll, you'll cry out and pray for that person. If you've got your hands up and you buy each other, y'all pray for each other. But matter of fact, let's stand to our feet. Let's stand to our feet, everyone in here. All right. Those of you who raise your hand, raise your hand again. Raise your hand again. All right. Raise it again. Because here's the deal. And some of you, watch. Let me say this while your hand's up. All right. Some of you were like, oh, I don't know if I want to raise my hand because I, I don't know if I want people to come pray for me. What you're saying is I don't really think it's going to make a difference. Again, unbelief. I believe it makes a difference. So we're going to pray for each other. So I, I need leaders and, and pastors and people. If, if you love Jesus and you know how to pray, I want you to get around these with their hands up and ask them, what are you believing for? And then we should hear nothing but praying. I just ain't, I, I better not hear no one talking about this and that. This ain't about talking about anything but about asking them, what is it you believe in for? And if that's you, you don't get, need to give them a whole history. Just give them what you believe in for. And then, and then everyone just started to start just praying. Just lay a hand. You want to be Christians? You want to play church or you want to be the church? I'm asking. You want to play church or you want to be the church? Well, this is how you be the church. All right, find someone with their hand up and let's begin to pray for people. Come on, I should hear praying all in this place. Come on, praying all in this place. You got a microphone to sing on? Someone get her a microphone up here to sing on. Sarah, just kind of flow in the spirit while we're praying. Come on, pray. Pray, believe. Call out to him, the Lord God Almighty, the Lord God Almighty, move. 
Lord, I lift up these situations in my mind to you. Move on them, my God. Move on them mightily, God. Lord, touch them like only you can, Holy Spirit. Like only you can, Holy Spirit. Your power, your might, your glory. You touch them, my God. Like only you can, Lord. Like only you can, Lord. Like only you can, Lord. Yes, Lord. Mm, come on. Yes, come on, pray. Pray. Yes, Lord. Oh, come on, I feel the Spirit. I feel the Spirit rising in the room. I feel the Spirit in this place. Oh, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We intercede for all of them, my God. I call out to you for all of them, my God. Move by your mighty hand and by your grace, Lord. Come on. Come on, feel the spirit in this place, guys. Forsake me in my weakness. I know you for me. I know that you are for me. I know that you will never forsake me in my weakness. I know that you have come now. to remind me I know that you are for me yes I know that you are for me I know that you would never forsake me in my weakness I know that you have come now even if to write upon my heart Feel the Spirit, church. Begin to lift your hands and let the Spirit of the Lord consume you. Let Him fill your every fiber of your every being. Who you are. You are good. You are good. Woo! Come out. You are good. Come on, begin to declare that. Come on, everyone in here, begin to declare. Come on, get that on the screen if you can, guys. Come on, say it. Oh, we declare, Lord. We thank you before it happens, God. Your mercy is forever. Oh, we call out your name, Lord. You are good. You are so good. Your mercy is forever. Your kindness is Come on, say it. Say it. Come on. Everybody, come on. Your goodness is forever. Your mercy is forever, forever. Oh, come on! Your kindness is forever. Your goodness is forever. Your mercy is forever, forever.
Come on, guys, just let, just get into spirit. Come on, get into spirit. You are good. Your mercy is forever. Or get into spirit. Come on, Sarah. Prophesy. Declare. We depend on you, my God. There is no other. Come on, can you confess that, Lord? There is no other. We depend on you. There is no other. Our faith and our trust is in you. It's in you alone. There is no other. There is nobody else coming. You're it. provider and my protector. Father, you are love. You are kindness. You are compassionate. Come on, tell him who he is to you. Father, you are the one that can open doors and close doors. Father, you are the one that you give forgiveness, Lord. You're the one. You are forgiveness. And we thank you, Father. Come on. Lift up the name of Jesus. Who is, who is Jesus Christ to you? Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, the great Messiah. You're the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You're the Prince of peace. You're our high priest. You're our high priest. You made a way for us. Your blood cleanses us. You're a healer. You're a wonderful counselor. You're the head of the church. Everything was made by you, through you, and for you. Lord Jesus, we honor your name. You are worthy of praise and honor and glory. You're worthy, Lord Jesus. You're worthy, Lord Jesus. We lift up your name, Lord Jesus. Come on, lift up the name of Jesus. Come on, lift up the name of Jesus. We lift up your name, Lord.
I'm sensing right now is the Lord saying, release your doubt. Release your doubt to me. Come on, right now, release it. Release your doubt and put your faith and your trust in the only thing that will not fail you. Our Holy Father and the Lord Jesus, our Savior. You're awesome, God. You're awesome, God. You're awesome, God. In Jesus' name, you're awesome, God. Come on, who loves the Lord in this place, man? Who loves the Lord in this place? Is anything too hard for the Lord? What is the work of God? To believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's try that again. What is the work of God? We got plenty to do, guys. Plenty to do. Y'all enjoyed tonight? Yeah. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap. Amen. Yeah. Hey, thank you so much for watching. Please like this video, comment if there's anything on your heart that you would like to share with the community. And be sure to subscribe and turn on your notifications so that you can be alerted every time we upload something new. You be blessed.